After uh, David made Solomon king, uh, you probably remember the story there in uh, 1 Kings 3. Uh, Solomon felt totally inadequate, of course, and, and then he, he has, a, in a sense, a, a vision of what the Lord wants to do through his life, and he, he, he prays and he asks the Lord to, to give him wisdom <clears throat> for really governing the people. It's such a tremendous responsibility, and, uh, and of course, we know that the Lord did give Solomon tremendous wisdom, not, not spiritual discernment. <clears throat> Unfortunately, that's not what he prayed for. But he was a, a great, great ruler, one of the great kings of the, of the ancient world. Uh, then in that chapter, uh, as if to demonstrate that, there's the story of two women that um, uh, were lived in the same home. And one of them, they both had newborns about the same age. And one of them uh, inadvertently had rolled over on her infant in the night and he was sus uh, suffocated uh, and what she did then is take her dead child and switched it with the other person's live baby uh, and then when the, the gal woke up in the morning she realizes her, her baby is, uh, is, is dead uh, and then in the light she says I realize it wasn't my baby it was the other ones and she perceived that uh, she had been uh, deceived. So the two women then come to Solomon, uh, as, as you know, and explain the whole situation to him. And of course, then Solomon at that point hears the whole thing out. Then he tells one of his servants to come and bring the sword. And they hold the, the baby up. And there's a, there's a classic uh, uh, artistic rendering uh, of this by one of the Renaissance painters. The, the person is holding the baby with the uh, outstretched sword. And uh, Solomon says, Take the baby and, because the dispute is, who's the real mother? Because the other ones say, no, I didn't really do that. That's, that's my baby. She's trying to claim. So who's the real mother? So Solomon says, well, just simply cut the baby in two. Give them each half. At which uh, the one mother then says, uh, the, the woman whose son was alive was filled with compassion for her son and said to the king, please, my Lord, give her the living baby. Don't kill him. But the other one said, uh, uh, neither I nor sh you shall have him, cut him in two. Then the king gave his ruling. Give the living baby to the first woman, do not kill him. She is the mother. Why was she the mother? Because Solomon could see that when it came to the life of her son, she was filled with compassion. And she would rather give him up than see any harm come to him. Solomon says, that's the real mother. Again, our subject this morning is the compassion of, uh, of Jesus, and, uh, and we've already seen it several times in a couple of other chapters and uh, made note of it in chapter 9. He had compassion on the crowd because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a, uh, a shepherd. And therefore, he says, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers uh, are few. Again, that word that we're talking about means moved with compassion, literally to have one's inner being stirred. We might use the term gut-wrenching. So it's not sympathy. That's, that's not the word compassion. Again, when we talk about Jesus having compassion or this woman having compassion, it means they literally physically felt something in their gut, in a sense. In fact, the same word is translated intestines in, in, a, in another place uh, in the New Testament. So this is something much more than sympathy. When Jesus looks out on a crowd of people that really don't know who he is in terms of the gospel, he's moved with compassion. Later in chapter 14, when, uh, when he has the crowd before him that he's been teaching, he knows they've gone all day without eating, he's very concerned about them, and he's moved with compassion uh, once again. But we'll find other stories where it's just an individual or it's two blind men. It's not just crowds, and Jesus is moved with, uh, with compassion. Uh, in Luke 15, when Jesus tells the story to try to demonstrate God's love, and he tells the story of the prodigal son, it says, you know the story, and he goes off and blows all of his money, and then he finally comes to his senses and kind of repents and says he'll go back and, uh, and may, basically uh, uh, make his case to his father, and maybe he'll just take him back as a hired servant and so forth. The father, when he saw him from afar, it says he ran to him because he was filled with compassion. 
And James 5.11 tells us that the Lord is full of compassion uh, and, and mercy. And, uh, and so here we have another situation that we'll look at where God shows compassion to the most unlikely person that could ever be imagined for Jesus as a rabbi, as Jewish, the cultural setting and so forth. Uh, it's a Canaanite woman. We'll talk more about her and there are certainly some things that we can uh, learn from her. So just to kind of put this in context, I've got a couple of maps for you. Uh, again, we've talked about the fact that you can see the yellow, the Galilee area where Jesus' ministry has taken place. Back a couple of chapters, we talked about the fact that Herod now wants to kill him, Herod the Tetrarch, and he would rule that yellow area. Jesus has now moved his ministry out of a Jewish setting into the, where it says the Decapolis. And we'll talk about that place in, in a moment. Uh, it just means the 10 cities. So there's 10 Roman cities, uh, one on the, uh, the west side of the Jordan, the other's on the east side of the Jordan. That's the area where Jesus is ministering as well, uh, right now. Why don't you go on to the next slide? And again, you can see the Sea of Galilee, uh, a little bit of the context where Capernaum is on that northwest side uh, and, and so forth. And, uh, and now we've moved completely to the other side. Just want to point out Caesarea Philippi because we're going to get there. We'll get there in a week or so. That's where Peter makes his confession that thou art the Christ, the son of the living God and so forth. Again, but just to emphasize, Jesus is staying out of that yellow area, the yellow area of Herod because he's quite willing to die, but he's going to die in his own timing and not by an edict of Herod, but on a Roman cross and on the exact day on Passover they were supposed to be. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, again, just to show you where uh, Judea, there's Jerusalem uh, further in the south to kind of see uh, all of Israel. Now to put a map over this to show you the present countries, uh, that's the way it's broken up uh, today. So where Jesus is in the Decapolis would actually be present day Jordan. Where he will go uh, further up would be Caesarea Philippi. Today is in what's called the Golan Heights, again part of, uh, of Israel. And not to get into it too much, but you can see that, that middle area uh, in, the, in the green area that says Samaria. That is the, you can tell, that is the heart of Israel. And that's one of the areas that uh, is under dispute uh, today. But anyway, so Jesus is, uh, is uh, very much, again, ministering now to uh, a non-Jewish audience. And that's one of the things that we need to see here. Let's look at the first uh, uh, section here, verse 21 to 28. Jesus shows compassion to a Canaanite woman. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possessions. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was only sent to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, is it not right to take the, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Yes, Lord, she said. But even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. Very, very again, very interesting. And certainly the thing that jumps off right away is, is the humility of this, of this woman. And certainly her determination. And we'll talk about some of those things. But though the main theme is the compassion of Jesus... I think that we can learn a lot from this woman. And uh, uh, just to talk about a couple of things about her. First, uh, the title. Uh, she presented her request by using a distinct title for Jesus. Uh, and the title was unusual because she's a, a Canaanite. And she calls him what? Son of David, a Messianic term, a Jewish term. Who are the Canaanites? Well, they were, had a curse placed upon them all the way back in, in Genesis 9. By the time Joshua enters the land, the Canaanites are dwelling there. And uh, if you want to read ancient history or just read the Bible, you'll find out one thing for sure. They were the most gross, barbaric, cruel, sexually immoral, um, despicable people that has probably ever lived on the face of the planet ever. And the, and, and the archaeological uh, remains from, from their cities and so forth uh, bear, bear that out. They're, they're despicable. 
and God is going to bring judgment on them. And the clear witness of Abraham as he was in that land, witnessing to them and so forth uh, for many years. And as Joshua moves in, we know that God uses uh, Israel to judge them. Those are, again, those are the, uh, the Canaanites. Uh, very interesting, in, in Genesis 38, though, <laughs> we find that uh, uh, they become part of the family of God. Genesis 38, 1, it says, at that time, Judah, one of the sons of, uh, of Jacob, uh, Judah left his brothers and went to stay with a man of Adullam named uh, Hira. Uh, there Judah met the daughter of a Canaanite man named Shua. He married her and lay with her, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son whose name was Er. So here's a Canaanite that actually is, in a sense, grafted in by, by marriage to the family of God with Judah. Uh, again, Judah becomes the, the lineage of, uh, of Jesus, the, the Messiah. One of the things that is interesting, and, and um, yeah, you can appreciate David Hawking being a guy for details. He read this and he just thought, I wonder if, and he wondered if uh, all 70 nations that are mentioned in, in the Old Testament are they all brought into the family of God by one of three ways that you can become a family? You can, you can marry into a family, you can be born into a family, or you can be adopted into a family. And uh, it took him a while, <laughs> but uh, every one of them, every nation that you can find in the Old Testament, every people group at some point in time is brought into the family of God in one of those three ways. Now the interesting thing about it is that how do we come into God's family? All three. We are brought in by marriage. We are the bride of Christ as a church. We were born into God's family as we were born again. And Paul says we are adopted in as the adopted heirs of, of Jesus Christ. So again, uh, but here's the, the point of this woman. Uh, she would understand enough <clears throat> of the fact that uh, she is a Canaanite. Uh, it was no secret that the Jews despised them. It was no secret that uh, the Jews going into that land had basically decimated her ancestors at one point in time. Uh, and it was no secret that the Jews looked upon them as being cursed. And it's no secret that Jesus is a Jewish rabbi <laughs> at that point. Some believing possibly the Messiah of Israel. Uh, and apparently she's heard that, seen things. And, and we, we find that uh, earlier on, that uh, Jesus is drawing such large crowds that some are coming from the Decapolis and obviously going back and telling the stories of those that have been, uh, been healed. But uh, here she is, uh, this woman, and we get a little more information from Mark's gospel because we have the account there. In Mark 7, 24, it says, Jesus left that place and went to the, the excuse me, vicinity of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to, to know it, yet he could not keep his pr uh, presence secret. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an evil spirit came and knelt at his feet. So again, this is not a, a crowd kind of situation. It's not out in the marketplace. <clears throat> this is in the privacy of a home. She hears about it. She kind of perseveres. And even though Jesus is trying to keep his presence secret at this point, she, she finds out. And then when she comes, she addresses him uh, as, the, as the son of David. Uh, Warren Wizardby says, when she approached him as the son of David, she was definitely putting herself on Jewish ground. And this she could not do because she was a Gentile. Uh, it's just a very interesting thing. It would have been, um, she, she had to be very, very desperate to do this. I mean, she, if, uh, and I don't, I don't even know how to put it in a modern day context or whatever. But uh, who she was as a Canaanite, given the culture, given the history, uh, you know, between them uh, and the Jews and recognizing who Jesus is. It, it's just very interesting that when she comes to him, she says, son of David. She, she calls him a Jewish uh, messianic title uh, for the rabbi. Very unusual. The second thing, she presented her, her request and it was not based on what she, she deserved. Her request for Jesus is to heal her daughter and she uh, makes that request by saying, have mercy on me. And as I said earlier, that the thing that impresses you or should impress you right away is that when she comes to the Lord with the request, she comes in tremendous humility, not believing that she deserves anything. But perhaps, perhaps he would show mercy. And what I want to suggest is that that's something we can learn from this Canaanite woman. Uh, I... Um, 
You know, sometimes when I, and I try not to watch uh, the religious uh, television sometimes because you get some guys on there that are in the name and acclaim of things. And, and some of the things that they teach that we can demand of God. And I just think that, man, it must break the heart of God. I mean, we, we, we deserve nothing. She was a Canaanite. She was cursed. And so are we with sin. Uh, but again, we have a relationship with Jesus Christ because he's cleansed us of our sins. He's done everything. And when we come to him, and we should come to him, and when we make our request, and we should make our request. And the writer of Hebrews says we can even do that confidently. But that confidence is not based on anything we do. We kind of have it in our minds sometimes that if I'm really good with my devotions, if I attend church enough times during the week, if I do this and I do this, then perhaps, then, you know, I have a, a stake to claim. I have a right to say. Then I can really expect God to do something. <laughs> no, we can't. No, we can't. We should always come in tremendous humility. We should always come like this woman, saying, have mercy, uh, mercy on me. The third thing, she presented her request with, with determination. And uh, the sequence of events is interesting. Verse 23, she was determined enough, even though Jesus didn't answer a word. I mean, she comes and, and uh, you think that probably had to be a really hard thing for her to do, this Canaanite woman to come to this uh, Jewish rabbi, Jesus, and present her, her request. Uh, and then when she does, and she's, you know, have mercy on me and everything, he doesn't say a word. Do you ever find that happening to you? You're presenting your request. <laughs> it's with all the humility, and you're pretty desperate and everything, and it seems like you're not hearing anything from the Lord. Well, she didn't either. Uh, but she didn't give up uh, as well. Uh, she continued, uh, continued on. Secondly, I mean, which could have been very discouraging, then the, the disciples hear all of this and said, their advice, the great advice, send her away. You know, which is what they said, you know, at the uh, feeding of the 5,000, when it's like, what should we do with all these people that haven't eaten all day and everything? Oh, send them away. That, that was their advice. Uh, in chapter 19, when, when uh, parents would bring their little children to Jesus for him to uh, bless them and stuff, which it was a, a, a very typical rabbinical thing to do. The rabbis in town take your kids and ask them to pray over them and bless them, just even as we do in a sense of baby dedications. What was the, uh, the advice then of the, of the disciples? Send them away, Matthew 19, 13. Then the little children were bought, brought to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them, but the disciples rebuked those who brought them. And uh, hang in there with the disciples because uh, if we're honest, we... I used to read this, these guys as a kid and think these guys are like the three stooges, except there's 12 of them, you know. But uh, as I'm a little older, I read it and I just totally relate. I mean, uh, the, the stuff they do, but the, the patience of God and all this for them. But how discouraging for this woman. She pleads her case. She says, have mercy. It's tremendous humility. Jesus doesn't answer. And then, and then the, uh, the disciples come and just send her away. Uh, but then notice that she's determined enough even though Jesus says in verse 24, I was sent only to the lost sheep of, of Israel. So it's like, when does, when does she just go, well, I'm, I'm out of here. I mean, I, I gave it my best shot, but she, uh, she doesn't. And again, why, why does Jesus go through this? And why does he say this? And why does he go through this little, little parable? Well, for one thing, again, even though he's withdrawn from the Galilee area, waiting for his time. He's already authenticated who he is, his ministry, done all the miracles and so forth. Been nationally rejected by, by the leaders of the Sanhedrin who've come up from Jerusalem. And we, we saw that committing the unpardonable sin on behalf of the nation and that generation. He withdraws, waiting for his time because he's going to die right on schedule, waiting for his time to go to Jerusalem. But he's still constantly teaching these guys, trying to prep them, trying to teach them, trying to get ready for uh, his death uh, and his departure. So he's always teaching them. Again, what is he teaching them here? Is that he's about ready to teach them that, that God has a heart big enough for the entire world. And again, we, we mentioned this with Peter last week. They're, they were so, you know, tunnel vision in terms of the Jews only. But he's going to give them the commission to take the gospel into the whole world. And he's demonstrating what he means right now. He's going to have a compassion for a person that they would believe that nobody should ever even uh, give a time of day or a look to or ever even walk in their vicinity. Uh, but he's, he's teaching them compassion for people that look different than you, that act different, that speak a different language, that are different culturally. We need to have compassion for everyone. 
And for this woman, he's testing her faith. How determined is she? How much faith does she really have? Now, he knows. He knows. He knows the outcome of all of this. But uh, he's really, again, uh, it's like in a sense, he's allowing her faith to play out to its fullest. Uh, and her determination uh, to play out to its fullest. So that she'd really even comprehend uh, how much faith and trust she had in the Lord. How much determination and certainly is an example to us. And by saying that I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel, he is reminding them and he is reminding us that he is the Jewish Messiah. Something the church quickly forgot and something that the church constantly needs to be reminded of today. What's her reaction to all of this? She gets down on her knees and says, Lord, help me. It's not a very long prayer, but certainly it's an effective one. And, uh, and the last thing is, she reprinted, presented her request with uh, what I'm calling a, a desperate faith. As he goes into this parable, he says in verse 26, It is not right to give the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. And, uh, and again, what was the word that Jews used to describe Gentiles? Dogs. <laughs> so, very interesting choice of words here. She could have been very offended at that point, don't you think? And just kind of walked away. But uh, she was pretty desperate. This her little girl. Uh, and as we look at the parallel counts, there's no doubt that she was demon-possessed. And there was no doubt that she was suffering tremendously as a result of it. If it's your child and she's laying in a hospital and there's no medical hope for her, how desperate are you in your prayers? In a sense, that's a good, that's a good place to be. I mean, that's... Uh, we, see, we see, again, Jesus isn't just playing with her. And the, the term that he uses is not the term that the Jews normally would use. They would use a term that means a, a, a dog that just lives out in the wild, that runs around in packs and so forth. Here he uses a term for a, a household pet or a, a little puppy. And she understands the distinction. He didn't just call me what they normally called me. He didn't just say what they normally say. And she says, that's true. What you just said is true. Again, a lot, a lot of humility here uh, in, in this woman. Is he the Messiah? She said he was. She said he was the son of David. If he's the Messiah of Israel and the Savior of the world, I'm not going to be offended by what you just told me. If you said that, it must be true. You know, a lot of people get real offended by things that Jesus say, and they, they, don't, they don't stick around long enough to find out the rest of the story. But this, this gal does. Uh, very desperate, very, very humble. And then, uh, she, this gal is a, is a thinker as well, because she makes the application. She says, verse 27, Yes, Lord, but even the, the little puppy, she might insert, the dogs, eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And... Uh, and, you know, there's a good question. Are you willing to settle for the crumbs that fall from the master's table and then be thankful? And she goes, I don't want much. Lord, what you can do, what you're capable of, you're the king, you're the Messiah of Israel, I'll just take the crumbs. I'm just asking for my daughter. I know it would be nothing for you. And what does Jesus say? Wow. Faith. He commends her. Tells her she has great faith. Now, it's interesting. There's only two times he says that in Matthew's gospel written by a Jew to a Jewish audience. There's only two times that he commends people for the great faith. This had to go over real big back in Jerusalem to a, a Canaanite woman and to a Roman satyrian. Those are the two guys that, in fact, to the Roman satyrian, he says, I haven't found like faith like this in all of Israel. And again, a, a continued, certainly true, but an assault on what was wrong with Judaism at that time and some of the religiosity that we looked at last week. Let's go on secondly. He's compassionate towards a Canaanite woman, uh, a person that it was so uh, off the radar and out of the scope of, of, of who you might normally think he would, he would even care about. But obviously he cared greatly. Uh, and then secondly, he shows compassion for, a, again, a Gentile, primarily a Gentile crowd. Verse 29 to 39. Jesus left there and went along the Sea of Galilee. Uh, then he went up on a mountainside and sat down. Great crowds came to him, bringing the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others, and laid them at his feet, and he healed them. The people were amazed when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled made well, the lame walking, and the blind seeing. 
and they praised the God of Israel. Jesus called the disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people, for they have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. I do not want to send them away hungry or they may collapse on the way. His disciples answered, where could we get enough bread in this remote place to feed such a crowd? How many loaves do you have? Jesus asked. Seven, they replied, and a few small fish. He told the crowd to sit on the ground. Then he took the seven loaves and the fish. And when he gave, th had given thanks, he broke them and gave them to the disciples. And they in turn to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. Afterward, the disciples picked up the seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was 4,000 besides women and children. After Jesus had sent the crowd away, he got into the boat and went to the, the vicinity of Magadha. So here again, Jesus continues to travel. We say in a, a Gentile area. Again, Mark's gospel tells us that uh, in Mark 7, 31, that Jesus left the, the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon down to the Sea of Galilee and into the region of the Decapolis, which I and mentioned on the map. And again, so uh, the 10 cities, the 10 Roman cities, if you take a, a tour or a trip to Israel, one of the places you will go to is to one of the uh, cities of the Decapolis, the Bashan. It's incredible. It's incredible. It's one of the largest archaeological sites I think that we saw. I mean, this was a city that had uh, ma major shopping malls, marble streets. The, the streets were lit at night. They had uh, a huge... Um, uh, baths with, uh, with hot water. Uh, the amphitheater that uh, is there, you can still, uh, the, uh, that will hold thousands, you can uh, stand in the bottom and, and speak in a normal voice and they can hear you uh, right at the top. It was a very modern city. It was a large city uh, and there were, there were 10 of them. And uh, this is the area that these people had, had, uh, had come from, uh, urbanites. Uh, you know, the Again, no, no background at all in terms of uh, what we would call the Bible or uh, really uh, not a lot of who Jesus was other than that he could do miracles. And uh, Jesus has gone up there to get away and get away from the crowds and those that are pressing him in, in the Galilee area. But here they are uh, once again. Uh, Matthew tells us he's followed by a great, great crowd. So again, it's plural with the, uh, uh, the great in front of it. Uh, and so uh, more than likely, we're talking uh, tens of thousands at this point uh, that are following Jesus. They come and they lay the, the, the cripple, the lame, the mute, and so forth. Uh, he heals them, all of them, every time, all the time, like he had done uh, throughout the gospel. And again, the emphasis is not that Jesus could heal a few people. Sometimes everyone all the time by the, by the thousands. And then thirdly, we see that Jesus had a concern for a human need. Verse 32, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. Uh, and again, that's our, certainly the, the theme of what we want to see here is that, uh, that God cares about each and every one of them. And what does he care about? He says he cares about their, again, the human need. They've been with me three days, nothing to eat. His concern, I don't want to send them away hungry or they may collapse on, on the way. Why does Jesus do this miracle and feed all of them then? Because he's concerned for human need. After all, they might collapse on the way. Are these his disciples? No. Are they Jewish? No. Do they really care anything about him? No, not necessarily. Uh, the last time he did this, the Jewish crowd wanted to make him king. These guys have no response at all. It's just he's concerned for human need. He's concerned that we might collapse along the way. I was reminded of this as I, I got a phone call. Remember, Yuki was staying with us, was our house guest. And Yuki is, uh, Peter and them, they, that first weekend, they were at uh, Cover Chapel West Tokyo with Pastor Santo, our good friend, and so his 16-year-old son. Yuki's been uh, staying with us, and then last week or so, Kathy and I drove him up to one of the families from North Shore Christian Fellowship where he'd be there the other, you know, 12 days or whatever before he heads back to Japan tomorrow. Well, he's been having a great time. They have a, a son the same age. They live like a block away from Waimea Bay, but and they decide something his son's done many times is uh, hike up the stairway to heaven uh, back here in Kaneohe, which uh, is a wonderful, brisk, you know, 5,000 steps at the top of the Koalaus. It's something like that. I mean, Bill, 
if Bill Keller was here, he, he welded the whole thing back together. He could tell you exactly how many steps there were. Uh, but anyway, uh, this is not a recommendation on my part. Uh, see footnotes in regards to whether you should be doing this or not. But anyway, these uh, kids, they, they go up there and they get to the top. And it is a view. I, we, I, I've been several times back in the day when you could sign off with the uh, Coast Guard Omega Station and go up there and stuff. And it's, it's, it's a killer because it's like a, going up a ladder, you know, for a long time. And uh, big ladder. And then um, don't want to slip. And then you uh, get to the top, and uh, beautiful up there, because you can actually see across the other way, you know, as, as well as this way, if you get up there and it's clear, which they did. They were enjoying that. There's an old pillbox at the top, and they were sitting on the pillbox, you know, like three or four feet off the ground, and they were about ready to head back and, and you know, just jumped off, landed on their feet. And when Yuki did, he kind of stumbled, and there were some old pilings right there with the old rusted rebar popping out and smashed his kneecap right into one of the rebar. Didn't know it at the time, broken in three places. Now at the top of the Koolau's, thousands of stairs. The worst part of that trip is it kills your, your legs. I can testify that because the last time I went up, the reason it was the last time is I tore the cartilage in my left knee trying to come down because it can be kind of slippery and you can, your leg can spin either way. So the Yuki is in excruciating pain now. <laughs> if it was me, I would have taken out my cell phone and... Uh, and uh, what's the number for 911? Yeah, I would have called that one and uh, just said, come give me a ride. I'm dying here. But uh, anyway, they put kind of a splint on it, these uh, other teenage guys that he's with. And now they start down <laughs> the, the stairway. And uh, anyway, he, uh, he did make it down in, uh, in a, lot of, uh, a lot of pain. And I want to suggest that Jesus did not allow him to collapse along the way. <sighs> I mean, how do, you, how do you do that? I mean, how do you get, how do you get down? Kathy went up and, uh, and saw him the uh, uh, day before yesterday on Friday. They, had, you know, made it to the hospital uh, eventually and uh, did some x-rays and took him back on Friday for, for surgery to get him ready, you know, to fly back tomorrow. And uh, so you could keep him in your prayers. But uh, she went up to see him. He came out of uh, surgery and she said to him, Yuki, how did, you, how did you get down from the top at such a long ways? You must have been in such pain. In his very limited English, one step at a time. <laughs> That's how you get down. It's one step at a time and just and trusting the Lord sometimes that he doesn't allow us to collapse on the way. But it's comforting to know that, that, that people in a sense that Jesus should not have cared about, he does. And, and much less the ones that that have come into a relationship with him. Now, I got, I'm emailing with the, his dad and, and uh, talking to Pastor Mike while this was all going on and trying to make sure his parents are uh, apprised of the situation. And I got an email back uh, from uh, Santa San and he had, uh, uh, you know, talked to Yuki on the phone and so forth. And, uh, and he emailed me and he said, I was hoping that while Yuki is here, he could attend the How to Walk conference. But instead, it's better. He's learning how to walk with the Lord. But that's a dad response right there. Mom's probably crying her eyes out. That's good, boy. This is really going to teach him. You know, I want him to. Good Japanese father, you know. Kind of a deal. So Santo handled it, uh, handled it well. Uh, Let's go back to our text a little bit. I want to make sure, just point out a couple of distinctions as we talk about why would Jesus do this and do this miracle. It has nothing to do with doing a miracle and it has nothing to do with authenticating his ministry. He's already uh, uh, fed 5,000 previously. And just to point out the difference in these two incidents very quickly. In one, he fed 5,000, again, counting the men, women, and children. The other one, 4,000. One was primarily Jews. One was primarily Gentiles. One was in the Galilee area near Bethsaida. The other one is the Nicopolis. One began with five loaves and two fish. One began with seven loaves and a few fish. One had 12 baskets left over. One had seven baskets left over. One, the crowd had been with him one day. The other, the crowd had been with him three days. One was in the spring of the year. And one was in the summer of the year. At one, they tried to make him king. And in this one, there was no popular response uh, at all. Two different incidents. He doesn't, in a sense, need to repeat this. They're 
in order to show something, prove something. My point is, the only reason he did this is because he had compassion for these people. He says, I'm not going to send them away because they might collapse on the way. And Jesus cares. Jesus cares about people that don't even care about him. I, I think certainly that's one of the things that we need to, uh, to see here. And, and the motive for what he did was simply meeting human need. Uh, next, we see that uh, Jesus must constantly teach the disciples that he has the ability to meet every need. Uh, now, again, we read this and go, okay, guys, do you kind of like remember what happened? You know, if you were there and Jesus and he feeds 5,000 people, the next time there's a crowd, we're out of food. I bet Jesus could do this, you know, but they, they don't. Now, in the next chapter, um, he even uh, makes reference to in chapter 16. You guys didn't even remember. And he, he, he kind of gets on their, their case a little bit for not remembering that he fed the, uh, the 5,000. Uh, but again, it's easy to look at these guys like the three stooges, but there's 12 of them uh, at the same time. But it's so do we ever do that? We forget how God provided before. We're so concerned in this situation. And then at some point in time, after we fretted and worried it over it a couple of days and finally decided that maybe I should pray and take it to the Lord and read the word and go to the Psalms and be comforted. And then I see something scratched in my Bible and the, oh, that's right. I wrote down that little incident. Yeah, oh, how, yeah, God was faithful before. Uh, but it's easy, it's easy. I mean, they forget and they were the eyewitnesses. We forget and we, we live through these, these trials and these things that God sees us through. And uh, I think the lesson for them, for us, is that it is our tendency to underestimate what the Lord can do with our lives. I think that's part of why he does this as well. The, the need, but he's constantly teaching these guys as he is going to be crucified and resurrected and leave and it's going to be up to them to carry the gospel to the whole world. There's a tendency at this point anyway for them to constantly underestimate what God can do in and through their lives. And I think, I think there's, a, there's a tendency for us as well. I want to show you a, a video clip if you can kind of bring that up. And we've got to go on the internet to, to grab it and stuff. But there's certainly an example of that, of, uh, of mind-blowing proportions uh, in terms of a young man, Castle grad, just about 10 years ago, uh, kind of had a troubled youth, uh, admittedly, came to faith in Christ, got involved in, in running. Mom wanted to make sure he'd be okay rather than go to the D big Division I school. She wanted him in a really good, solid Christian college. It might be smaller, but uh, she wanted him to go to that school, which was Azusa Pacific. Uh, he goes there. And then connects with the coach there and deepens his commitment to Christ. And, uh, and nobody would have ever guessed. Everybody would have underestimated how God could use this young man's life. It's Brian, Brian Clay. My name is Brian Clay. I do the decathlon. And I am from Honolulu, Hawaii. And this is my family. You know, as a world-class athlete, I guess the main pressures would be uh, once you're on top, you know, you've kind of got that target on you where everybody's, you know, watching you. Um, they're training to basically to beat you, and you're training to try and stay at the top. And so it's, it's a tough position to be in, but um, for the most part, uh, you know, there's not a whole lot of pressures except for the pressures that you put on yourself. Um, and, and for myself, being very competitive and, and wanting to be the best that I can be, of course, I, you know, I put the pressure of wanting to win on me. But at the same time, uh, you know, my faith and, and everything else that goes on in my life also helps me put things into perspective and understand that winning isn't everything, um, making money isn't everything, uh, you know, being famous isn't everything. And so when I can keep my priorities in order, um, it allows me to not be as stressed out. It allows me to not have the same pressures that other people might have while they're competing. Well, my, my wife, Sarah, um, you know, she's probably one of my biggest fans. Um, she definitely is the person that uh, keeps me grounded, that keeps, you know, kind of holds my kite string so I don't, you know, 
get a little too off track or start flying away too far. Um, and then my kids, uh, I've got my son Jacob who is two, gonna be three in, in a little bit, and then my, my daughter, uh, Catherine. They don't wanna sound like, you know, I don't enjoy track, but they're the joy of my life, you know? I mean, it is, there's nothing better than being a dad. You know, I enjoy being a dad. Every t second that I get, I try to get home and, and spend time with them and play with them. And, you know, I'm learning so much from, from them and my relationship with them and, and learning so much more about um, my walk with Christ and how much more important it is um, than I than I knew before I had kids and you know realizing now that you know I'm responsible for for them and not just them but my wife and, and seeing all these responsibilities that I have as a as a father and as a husband um, has really changed my walk with Christ. I'm not sure what my impact is on, on the other athletes, and I think, uh, you know, it'd be fun to know. But I, I trust in the fact that what I'm doing, the life that I'm living, um, the decisions that I make when I'm around those guys, and even when I'm not around the other athletes, um, I, I'm trusting that God, you know, is, is working that out and planting those seeds and helping, you know, to water them and make them grow. <laughs> I think my job is just to let them know that there's something else out there, that you don't have to live um, the type of lifestyle that we see so many athletes living, that there are people that are successful that do, that do it another way. Uh, the, the more I can be you know, sound spiritually, mentally, physically, emotionally, the, the better I'm going to do um, at my athletic career. So God first, family second, track third. Hi, Pooper. How are you? Yeah. My name is Brian Clay. I do the decathlon, and this is my family. And Brian Clay is the greatest athlete in the world today, according to Olympic standards. He's the, dec the gold medal winner of the decathlon, and uh, you have the Olympics is about track and field. Everything else is an add-on, and he is the winner of the most prized event of the track and field, the, the decathlon. And uh, who would have thought that? This young guy growing up in Kaneohe, going to Castle High School. Uh, but we so underestimate what the Lord can do. So, I mean, if you <laughs> commit your life to the Lord, you're going to win a gold medal. The gold medal wasn't what he was talking about. And of course, that was beforehand, but he'd already won a silver. The issue was his relationship with his Lord, the relationship with his family, the influence he could have on others for the kingdom of God. That's what God's concerned about. But God's given him a platform, and he's, and he's using it. And we can be thankful for that and want to keep him in our, our prayers. But the, again, the, the point is here is that these guys that Jesus is trying to teach, that Jesus is trying to, to train have a tendency like we do to underestimate what the Lord can do in and, in and through our lives. But again, he saved us for a purpose. We're God's, you know, workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works unto him. Let's not underestimate. Let's learn the lesson of the compassion that Jesus has. He won't let us stumble along the way. And even the, the lessons that we can learn from a, a Canaanite woman. Who is like you, Lord of heaven, King of glory, throned in majesty. You are holy, you are holy. Who can fathom all the riches of your mercy, of your faithfulness? You are worthy. You are worthy. Who is like you, Lord? Who is like you, Lord of heaven, King of glory, throned in majesty? You are holy. You are holy. Let's put our hands together. Who can fathom all the riches of your mercy, of your faithfulness? You are worthy. Let heaven and earth join in. 
can I give? What can I bring? What can I sing as an offering? What can I give? What can I bring? What can I sing as an offering? What can I give? What can I bring? What can I sing as an offering? Oh. What can I give? What can I bring? What can I sing as an offering? Oh. What can I give? What can I bring? What can I sing as an offering? Lift 
When I fell down, you did. 